edifying the believers and glorifying the God. Uh, we are at our Bible study on uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, uh, verses um, 12 and 19. Thank you. Uh, and with, uh, let's get into it. Uh, Jerry from Green Mission. Thanks, Alex. Appreciate that. <clears throat> All right. So, welcome again to our Bethany ba Baptist Church location here in Ottawa uh, for our weekly Bible study in association with BereanNation.com. Uh, Dan, would you be willing to, from your place there, open in prayer for us? Don't worry about the microphone, kind of thing. Lord God, to help us be gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can gather together to study and learn from your word. We pray that you send the Holy Spirit to each of us to, uh, to give us knowledge and understanding and wisdom, in particular, that you help each of us to know and understand what you would have us to know and understand in your word in the first letter of Peter, chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. I pray this in the name of your only begotten Son, Jesus, my Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. All right, so as Alex pointed out a little earlier, this week we are in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 to 19. I think even Dan mentioned it as he prayed. Uh, so let's read the chapter as a group, um, just so sort of we can get the text into our minds and properly study it. Um, there are eight verses. There are more than I tell you what, let's let's do it this way. Dan, will you read the first four? And maybe I'll read the last four. How's that? Take the break tonight, Alex. <laughs> From here? Yeah, it's fine. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fire of trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. <clears throat> Verse 16. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be shamed, but is to glorify God in this name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Therefore, those who also suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what's right. And we thank the Lord for the reading of his word. Um, <clears throat> just before we get started, uh, we always explain what we're doing because it's not always straightforward evident. We conduct what is called a chapter summary Bible study, or perhaps you've heard it uh, called the, uh, uh, sorry, the inductive method of Bible study. Uh, at least that's what they taught it to us as in Bible college. And um, we ask ourselves basically three questions. The first question is, what does the chapter or the text under consideration say. And I'm saying chapter or text because we're reading tonight less than one chapter. So what does the text say? What we do to determine what it says is well, first we read it, but we break that section of text down into paragraph-sized thought units, give each one of those paragraphs a little title and, you know, five to ten words is usually sufficient. I've seen longer, I've seen shorter, so whatever. But um, after that, what we do is look through those titles for a common theme. And from that common theme, we give it an overall title. We pick out a verse from the text that supports our understanding of that passage. 
or that is key to our understanding, so our key verse, if you like, you see what I did there, and that's what the chapter says. <clears throat> the second question we ask is, what does that mean? That's what it says, what does it mean? We do not, and I must emphasize this, we do not ask, what does it mean to me? Because frankly, that's not relevant. Uh, it can mean a million different things to a million different people. What we're after here is what God meant when he inspired the writers or dictators of scripture to pick those words to use, because words have definitions and meanings like that. So what does that mean? That's what we're after, not what does it mean to me? And third, what are we going to do about that? Um, I suppose you could say, what does that mean to me? But no, it's not. It's confusing. What am I going to do about it? This is where we've derived more personal kinds of applications from what the Lord said in that section of text, in those words, to at that time, historically, etc. Um, sometimes that's broad brushstroke principles, and that's good because we need to know those things. Sometimes it's, oh, I better do that, and I better do that like tomorrow morning kind of thing. And that's okay because we need that too. So that's what a chapter summary is. And for those that have prepared one ahead of time and written it down, we give opportunity for folks to share. So who came this evening with a chapter summary that they had ready ahead of time? Hands. Wow, that's rare. Nobody came on the chapter summary. No? I'm sad. <laughs> okay, not really. But... All right, so we'll just jump right into what I have to say. <clears throat> so after a discussion I had this week on Sunday um, about sermonizing and another on Monday with another student of the Bible, I was reminded that all good biblical analysis is based on three crucial rules for Bible interpretation. And in order of importance, those are, number one, context. Number two, context. And number three, context. Yes, Dan? Oh, I... I thought you were going to ask for suggestions for one. No, but when you raise your hand, I do get the idea that you have questions. So, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so this this idea of context is really mission critical to all interpretive efforts from Scripture. Otherwise, the saying is true that I can do all things with a verse taken out of context, right? Okay, so God inspired the writers of Scripture, all of them, including the New Testament writers, to use specific words to make specific statements. That means that any given passage of Scripture has a specific meaning. Even if, and maybe especially if, you don't like what that scripture says. When someone stops you, usually at several more decibels than necessary, it's to inform you that that's your interpretation. So when they do that, you need to realize a few things. First, you probably realize that the person addressing you does not agree with what you're saying or what the scripture is saying and probably doesn't like what you said. Um, I get that. And, and you've heard some people around here even say that to me and some in other places because we've known each other a long time. Now, rather than what I used to do, become angrily combative about what I try to do these days is I try to calmly ask for clarification of the issue that they have. But there are grounds at that question for a well-grounded counteroffensive, depending on the point. And it goes like this. 
oh, you say you're yelling at me that that's just my interpretation? No, it's not just my interpretation. Um, this is the historical interpretation of Orthodox Christianity. Also, when you say that, that that's just my interpretation, you're suggesting two things, both of which are not correct. First, you're suggesting that there is more than one correct way of looking at the scriptures. Second, you are suggesting that all others except your own are incorrect. That's what the logic arguments come down to at any rate. What that means is that before you step into that answer, you must absolutely know the orthodox historical Christian position. Uh, one example of, of this is actually something pretty near and dear to our hearts at Berean Nation. Uh, we actually, uh, I'm bringing this up just as an example, but some things may come out that you may not agree with. Listen to the end, please. One of the things we don't particularly agree with at Berean Nation, I'll get into the short reason why, is what's called decisional evangelism. Um, yeah, uh, this is actually not the Orthodox Christian view. Um, this idea kind of began with uh, a bunch of guys in Holland called the Remonstrants under a guy named Arminius, perhaps you've heard that name. But it was really given legs by a man with the name of Charles Finney. Finney had some good things to say, without a doubt, but like all of us, he wasn't right about everything. Um, about the same time, through a man named C.I. Schofield, a theological framework called dispensationalism uh, became popular because of his Bible study refer note, reference notes that were published in many uh, Bibles of the day. So if you have someone say, I have a C.I. Schofield reference Bible. You can know they've got one of those with the Schofield notes in it, and it's a King James Version, probably a Cambridge 1769 version, because that's the one the King James only has to settled on as the ultimately correct version, because it was also the Oxford 1769, and they gave the weight to the Cambridge. So uh, however they, they did that, I'm not really sure I'm not a King James only. <coughs> So this led to the mess that we now have in evangelism, uh, evangelicalism uh, that says Jesus loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And if you'll just invite him into your life, he'll make you healthy, wealthy, and wise. And you'll go to heaven when you die, unless you're alive when Jesus comes back. In that case, you'll be raptured with the rest of the church. <laughs> okay. Um, none of that is actually the traditional historical Orthodox Christian position, just to let you know. Um, but that's today's mess of the modern gospel, which is really not a gospel at all. And it takes a few minutes to unpack that. So we're going to take a few minutes right now to unpack that because I think it's essential to understanding the text for this evening. The points that I'm trying to make are how to study the scriptures. And these are really what I think are mission critical to people that would be, well, trying to study the Bible. Okay, so first, dispensationalism itself, though it has many attractions, is not sound theologically without a covenantal view of theology. Um, but that's not really my point here. There are three other views that could be held or discussed. Um, and they all revolve around the millennial reign of Christ. Um, the first view of those is premillennialism. Uh, sorry, the first view of those is premillennialism. Um, and, and it says that the reign of Christ on earth is a still future event. Um, that's where I come down personally, though I'm not going to get into my reasons for it here. Some claim that the millennial reign has already begun. Um, we refer to those people as post-millennialists. 
Usually you can find an idea known as preterism here as well, which is the idea that all New Testament prophecy has already come to pass. Not always. The two are usually married in, the, in this way. You have postmillennialism with partial preterism. Um, full preterism is heretical, but partial preterism is not. I'm not going to get into all the details of that right now. Okay. Um, there are folks that suggest, on top of that one, that there is no actual millennium. Okay, and we call these folks a millennium. That's not the word I choose, but okay. Uh, probably though, to the surprise of no one, the term is amillennialism. So both, both post and amillennialism have some theological issues, but neither of those is the historical or orthodox Christian position either. That would be premillennialism, of which dispensationalism is a subcategory. Now, the main difference is that much of dispensationalism concerns itself with what is called the rapture, and more particularly and more dangerously, the timing of it. Uh, Jesus himself said he did not know when the Father would call for that event that I'm not going to claim to. Second, um, I think everyone here is at least somewhat familiar with the Calvinistic acrostic of TULIP, which are the so-called five points of Calvinism. Now in the late 15 and early 1600s, Arminius led this group of uh, followers of his to become what I think of as semi-Pelagian in their thinking, uh, which means they're semi-heretical. Um, and that means they believed that man still had enough good in him to make moral choices, which is clearly not a biblical idea if you've ever read the thing. And, and look, we around here at Berean Nation can actually demonstrate that from the scriptures. So you need to think very carefully about that stuff. But these folks called themselves the Remonstrants, um, and they wrote a treatise on the subject that they, inten that they intended, at least, to become an extra-biblical standard of salvation. Um, back in the day when the Reformation was in full stride, the Dutch Parliament, yeah, the Dutch Parliament, government got involved, uh, wrote a document known as the Canons of Dort in response to the Remonstrance, and it outlined five basic points, and those points are, first, the radical depravity of humanity humanity, also known as total depravity in the uh, tulip acrostic. Okay, second, the sovereign election of, of God for believers. That's also known as unconditional election. Um, that's the U in the acrostic. Uh, the third point was a definite atonement that Christ made for fallen humanity. They called that limited atonement. Uh, which I think actually focuses on the wrong kind of question, but regardless, the definite atonement that Christ made for fallen humanity, that's the L in the acrostic. The I is, of course, the fourth one, the irresistibility of that call of grace from God to humanity at the point of salvation. And the last one is the P, that's the preservation or the perseverance of the saints through the sanctifying trials that we've been reading all about in Peter here, um, until the Lord's return for the believer, either individually or collectively in the Harpazo event, however that works. And I don't claim to be an expert on that. Now, those are the five points of Calvinism. They are in response to Arminius and represent the actual historical and orthodox outlook of the faith from Christ to the apostles down to the present day. Third, and this is mission critical for understanding tonight's text, the gospel is not for our human benefit alone. And this was one of the problems that Arminius had. Um, what that blossomed into modern day is something that we know 
uh, is labeled by most folks as the word of faith or charismaticism, although the two are slightly different. And not always, but most often connected. Um, word of faith teachers, mostly known around here as false teachers, who include folks like Ken Copeland, Ken Hagen, Sid Roth, Jesse Duplantis, Creflo Dollar, and a whole host of others that would take me more than half an hour to name, tell us that God will give us perfect health and material wealth as we walk with their version of Jesus Christ. As we plant our seed of faith by following these leaders, and that's their code phrase, for send me your money. Uh, as it turns out, this is all a scam that is designed to make the preachers incredibly wealthy, but at your expense. Beloved, Christians are born, or rather born again, or born from above, to suffer, according to Peter, in this very letter. And there is a meaning to that suffering I'll explain by getting into the greater context to which this letter from Peter was written. Now, Peter wrote this letter in response to events that were taking place in that day against Christians. <clears throat> you gotta know a little history here. Uh, one of Rome's most avid builders, uh, and he's a man who is no stranger to those of us who hang around MariaMation.com. His name was Caesar Nero. And he seemed to think that he could do no wrong. So Nero wanted to rebuild parts of Rome uh, in his own image that he had conceived uh, himself for those areas, probably so that he could glorify himself directly. Um, and to be fair, he, he was a great builder for the Roman Empire. So what Nero did was he ordered the burning of Rome, particularly the slum areas, so that he could rebuild them in this image that he had conceived. Everyone knew it at the top political levels, by the way. Um, there is literature from the time written by Roman senators that revealed that the order actually came from Nero himself. However, this action created a serious issue for Nero to, well, stick handle since we're Canadian. Um, and it seems that many more people than Nero, many more people than Nero anticipated were negatively affected by the fire in terms of loss of assets, loss of life, personal sufferings, basically a big, big tragedy. Um, and these people were all, of course, inhabitants of Rome and therefore Roman citizens. The anger that seethed through the entire empire at this horrific tragedy was apparently very palpable at the time. And it threatened to cause Nero's assassination if it were not handled quickly and efficiently. It was because of this that Nero found what we today call a scapegoat or a different party to shoulder the responsibility of the action and subsequent blame that went with it. Uh, now for this he chose uh, a newly rising sect of people that were actually associated with the Jews who were by no means popular in Rome and who did not honor or otherwise worship the so-called gods of the Roman pantheon. In fact, these people were often misnomered as atheists for that reason. These people were actually our early brothers and sisters in Christ. And as soon as Nero set up a fake Christian who confessed and called falsely on the name of Christ, the fix was in. The reaction to the news was instant, and it was violent. Um, it poured a sort of hunter's mark on the body of Christ for the next 250 years or so, in fact. Christians were arrested. Um, some were put to death in the arena by having 
starved animals feed on them while they were still alive. Some perished at the hands of gladiators as they refused to take lives. Some were executed. Both Paul and Peter suffered this fate at this time, ultimately. Some were doused with a flammable accelerant and lit on fire to light Nero's palace garden. Well, that's what Peter wrote this letter to address. He wanted to give his brothers and sisters that made up the body of Christ something to hold on to and direction on their behavior under such conditions. Peter never addresses the subject more than generally in terms of the suffering that individuals were going through, but historical context makes it very clear what was going on and gives real strength to the whole argument of the letter itself. What I find absolutely amazing is that the message that Peter gave them then still applies to us today, though in varying degrees. I've never personally been threatened with execution for my beliefs, for example. Although I have been mocked while speaking them, and I think everyone here has maybe undergone something like that. I've never been threatened with being turned into a human torch or crucifixion for my faith. I have been threatened with violence by a couple of really interesting people over the years. And there may have been supernatural influence over those people. But people I know have personally and have personally been physically assaulted for preaching Christ. Uh, my friend Steve, who's a pastor in Florida, was actually put in a hospital by a group of homosexual men that had actually asked to hear what Steve had to say. That was a few years back now, but it happened. Um, in fact, Steve is a great example to all of us. Um, I don't agree with all points on theology with Steve either, but um, this isn't always about the purity of doctrine um, in terms of orthodoxy. Anyway, um, for example, I know Steve is an amillennialist. Um, um, I'm not. He knows what I think. And we just respect each other and treat each other like brothers in a discussion. You know, he'll try to persuade me, I'll try to persuade him. That's pretty much where we leave the conversation. Uh, that's the kind of thing to which Peter is referring in the text this evening. With that, let's get into the study. I broke the chapter down like this. Taking verse 17 as my key verse, I titled the chap this part of the chapter, A Pivotal Decision. What is the reason for your suffering. Uh, verse 17 reads, For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God, and if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? Verses 12 to 14 I titled, Difficult Trials. Are you really surprised they show up? Verses 15 to 18, Now is the time that judgment begins with us. And verse 19, therefore, suffer for what is right, not for what is wrong. Now, as you'll recall, and we do wish to be consistent here, we adhere to the historical and orthodox biblical model of justification by faith alone here. And we're not talking about justification when we speak of salvation in this letter. Peter himself defines what he's talking about in chapter 1, verse 9, when he tells us, quote, the outcome of your faith is the salvation of your souls, unquote. I did insert the word is, but just to anglicize the whole thing and correct the grammar of what I was saying. He says that as we walk with Christ in his spirit, we obtain this outcome. That's chapter 1, verse 9. So here, we're talking about more than just simple justification by faith. We're talking about sanctification by suffering alone, something that is not monergistic like justification. That is, it does not come from the divine single source of God. 
Um, being made holy is said to be synergistic work between Christ and the Holy Spirit and us as we cooperate with him in our sufferings, which are simply opportunities to walk in his faith and the new character that he gives us at our justification. In justification, we had nothing to say or do to gain it. It was a single source work of God, so monergistic. Here, we have choices to make and commands to willingly follow, and that's what he is talking about. Let's introduce the text and get into it. You'll see what I'm saying. Again, verse 17, a pivotal decision. What is the reason for your suffering? For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will the outcome for those, what will, yeah, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? The decision we have to make is the reason for our suffering. Uh, I have to say here that everyone in life suffers. If nothing else, it's part of the curse from when sin entered the world. But we suffer whether we are sinners or saints of the Most High God. However, Peter will inform us here that we do have some choice in the matter. We can, though we should not, suffer for our own wrongdoings. Or we can suffer as we discussed last time for doing the right thing and walking with the Savior. We choose here by our behavior. Now I know that kind of sounds like a Dr. Philism, but it really is the case. Choose the behavior, choose the consequences. So my first paragraph is verses 12 to 14, which I titled Difficult Trials. Are you really surprised they show up? Seriously, ask any young adult, okay? They tell us they suffer constantly, and in some measure, they do. <laughs> some of it is self-inflicted. How much, I won't say, and it differs probably from individual to individual, but occasionally, those reports are not just teenage angst. Some of you know that my youngest, who is here this evening, I'm happy to say, was recently baptized. And as a part of her interview, uh, that I and her mother, by the way, were not present at, on purpose, they told her that her classmates and the same age associates would give her a hard time. Um, they are correct, and they knew it. What they were looking for was her reaction to the statement. Um, I'm told that she acknowledged the point in, in our own conversations between her and I, she tells me that some of her <clears throat> friends uh, have abandoned her because of her stance for Christ in school. And she was not surprised, but saddened that they can't see the spiritual reality that's going on for all of us behind the scenes. Am I making any of this up, sweetheart? I never said that they abandoned me for my stance. No, I, 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 I read into that, but there are reasons people don't <laughs> I'm just saying. And you, you, you acknowledged it to people other than me. So, anyway. All right. Anyway, nonetheless, she was not surprised. And I use that as an example of what I mean. Everyone will suffer. Will your suffering be worth it? Now, there's an easy way to find out. Where do you stand, ask yourself this question, where do you stand as regards the person and work of Jesus, son of Joseph? Yes, I, I phrased it that way on purpose. But really, who is he to you? Is he just the carpenter Joseph's son? Or is he some great moral teacher? Which isn't an option, he left us by the way. Is he a prophet of God. To my Muslim friends I ask directly, is he simply the most pure of the prophets, Isa? Well, if he is, 
then you need to listen to what he says, right? So what does he say? In a conversation with a man named Nicodemus, who was a Jewish religious leader, Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again or born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That is John chapter 3, verse 3. That phrase, born again, is the Greek phrase, geniki uh, anothen, and it simply means to be born again or born from above. Uh, it actually means both, and I think the Holy Spirit knew that uh, and inspired John to write it in just that way to play a bit of a word game. Uh, shows that he has a personality and even displays a sense of humor. That's the Holy Spirit, the third person of Godhead. Um, but that's what he, your most pure of the prophets, actually said you need to do. Why? Well, because the first time we're all born, we are dead in our first parent's sin. For that reason, you must be born again from above, literally made alive, and in Christ by the Holy Spirit, as He, the Holy Spirit, comes to dwell in you, which is the same as Ephesians, Christ coming to dwell in your heart by faith. What you need to do for that to happen is to turn from your sins. That's all the things that you know are wrong, but you can't seem to stop yourself from doing. Or maybe you don't want to stop doing them. The Greek word for this is metanoia. It simply means to change your mind to the opposite point of view. Turn away from your sins by stopping the behavior and follow Christ and what he tells you in his word to do. Then you must believe that Jesus paid for your sins personally on the cross when he suffered and died there. When you do that, scripture tells us, God will save you from his coming wrath, which we'll talk about a bit later, I think. <clears throat> At this point, though, we should probably get into the text and see what Peter is saying to his fellow believers, which includes us. So, verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. Now, the very first word that Peter uses in this verse, in the Greek, is the Greek word agapetoi, which is translated beloved. And that's its meaning. Um, but remember, it's a form of the word agape, that's God's love here, not ours. We must also remember that this letter is written to believers, the beloved. He doesn't say men and brethren. He doesn't say all you Gentiles who don't believe. He doesn't say you scribes and Pharisees here. He says beloved. This letter is written to believers and this is just one of the ways that Scripture uses to remind us of this reality. It is an intimate address, and it is written to those that God has chosen for himself, those who have turned to him in repentance and faith. We just talked about the gospel a little, so this is a result of turning to the gospel. <coughs> and these results, well... Let's have a look, because I expect that this is not what a lot of churches teach today. And I've been to a few over the years, and I haven't seen a lot of this. So what it says here is, after the word beloved, it says, Do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you. Now remember, we know what that fiery ordeal was being tied to a stake on an elevated platform, being doused in 
like coal oil or something, and then lit on fire to die as you light Nero's garden. That'd be a fiery ordeal, wouldn't it? So, sometimes it actually involved actual fire, yeah. Now, Peter here is referencing the persecution of the church under false charges by the emperor of the world, Nero. What does Peter say? Hey, we're taking heat. Don't be surprised by it. After all, we were warned that this was going to happen by our Lord Jesus. Look for me for a moment to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, I'll start in verse 18. It says, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. That's John 15, verses 18 and 19. So hey, we were warned. This is also undeniable proof that the followers of Christ stand for something different than the rest of the world. Think about Polycarp. Oh, just a little pinch of incense in the fire, Polycarp. But he would not offend our Lord. Thankfully, our ordeal is not like theirs was. But we do have the same kind of thing happening. Today, our so-called leaders will tell us, oh, it's just a temporary church restriction until fill in the blank. Yeah. Um, it's for your safety. Is it really? Or is it to control us? Combined with other things that are going on in society right now, I think the latter. But we were warned, and by our Lord himself. How pastors can ignore this is beyond me, by the way. Uh, but they do, and they can even justify themselves with logic in doing so. Somehow, I think that they're going to have to answer to that for uh, answer for that to our Lord. So I'm just going to let that topic be, and, and so should we all. Polycarp never formed a protest group, nor did he ever politically resist. He just wouldn't do it when it came down to it, and, and that's what I think Peter is saying here. Otherwise, why would he intimate that this kind of trial was quote? for our testing. After all, it is a choice to follow Jesus. And one people are free not to make. But they need to be aware of the choice either way and both sets of consequences. And that is the reason we study the Bible together. <clears throat> Now, Peter also tells us that this isn't something strange. For the believer, we should expect this. We've already talked a bit about the wise, but for the follower of Christ, you must know right at the outset <clears throat> that for all of your Christian walk, you will be moving counter current. Many believers have said this over the years in many ways. Francis Schaeffer uh, called it a culture, uh, counter-cultural journey, uh, or something like that, I think. I don't know, it's been a while since I, I've seen How Shall We Then Live, so I don't really recall precisely. But uh, a preacher friend of mine from the Brethren Assembly called it swimming upstream. Now, ironically, his name is Peter. Um, but I think that swimming upstream thing is an apt analogy. Uh, I don't know who originated the phrase, but we are decidedly going against the flow, <laughs> okay? Um, and, and going against the flow will take constant effort, or you will lose ground. So how does Peter suggest that we move countercurrent like this? Next verse. Verse 13, But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, Keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory, 
you may rejoice with exultation. Interestingly here, he, he says something familiar to all Pauline students. Keep on rejoicing, you know? Look for a moment at Philippians chapter four. Verse four says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. You know, people say that Peter and Paul say different things, but the scripture really doesn't support those assertions. Uh, here's a case where they both say precisely the same thing with the same words, <laughs> okay? The context of Paul's remarks were about a feud that was raging between two sisters, Euodia and Syntyche. It was causing problems for the saints in Philippi. And Paul was saying that despite that suffering and trial, for the believers there to keep rejoicing in Christ, because it was the answer to the problem. So what are the words of Peter here? But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing. You know, uh, he even adds a reason here. So that at the revelation of his, that's Christ's glory, you may rejoice with exultation. In other words, when we see Christ in his glory from heaven, we may exceedingly be filled with joy. And that's just a rephrasing of what the verse says. I haven't changed the meaning at all. There is something about that joy in Christ that has an inspiring effect. The Greek word Cairo here is the one that means literally to be glad in this verse. In fact, gladness is a part of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. The second one mentioned. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, etc. Now, I'm not Eric Idle, and I'm not going to sing Keep on the Sunny Side of Life for you, but uh, I also don't think that's exactly what this means. But that positive attitude, that joy in Christ, about how the Lord is progressing things around you, is to be sought, and is to be nurtured, and is to be grown in your life. If you can, you should be finding reasons to be glad. Now, where do you think we can look for reasons to be glad? Anyone? All right, well, if you said the word of God, you're correct. Verse 14. <clears throat> and here's the reason. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Happy, spiritually prosperous. Because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Wait a minute. These people are going to say mean things to me? And I'm supposed to be happy about that? That's actually not what this is saying. It's saying if you are reviled, you are happy or should be because it is a sign that you are Christ's, that the glory of God rests on you. So Peter gives one. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Beloved, if you're being persecuted, you're doing this right. <laughs> now, I know no one likes to suffer, but if you will live the Christian life, you will suffer. It says so here. Indeed, all who live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's sort of a synonym of the word reviled. It does mean something slightly different, but still. That's 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. These are some of the last words that Paul ever wrote down. He knew it. And he unashamedly did not deny it on his way to being beheaded for his faith. So this can be an indicator of regeneration as well. I'll just throw in a handful on purpose. If you always want to avoid this kind of suffering, you should question your own redemption. Okay? Paul said it this way. Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. 
Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you fail the test. That's 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. If Christ is in you, you have already passed the test. Actually, you didn't, Christ did, but that's not the point. If he is not in you, you will never pass the test unless in his mercy he regenerates you. Turn to him and ask for forgiveness of your sins. Stop doing those wrong things you know offend God. And believe in your heart that he paid for your personal sins on the cross. And that God was so pleased with that sacrifice on your behalf that Christ was raised from the dead because that's the proof he paid for your sins and that its power in your life is broken. That should fill you with joy and gladness right there. Okay. Now, Peter has not really moved off of his initial point of encouraging his brothers and sisters in Christ in the face of intense Roman persecution. And he has not said anything different than Paul or James though he has had different emphases than both of those New Testament writers. His gospel is no different than that of Paul or James, and we will see later John and Jude, and it is the same also. Salvation in all of these men and, and all of the other writers of the New Testament is in Christ alone, by faith alone, that comes through grace alone. And Peter's point, though it will morph into application, will still not change as we look at the next paragraph. Verses 15 to 18, now is the time that judgment begins with us. Now, Peter saw that this persecution is clear as a beginning of judgment on the entire world. Judgment from God even has an order about it. And again, that really shouldn't be a surprise to us, especially those of us who study the attributes of God. Those characters of the fruit of the Spirit, for example, are actually part of the character of God. You know, that doesn't surprise us either, I know. And as God makes us the righteousness of God in Him, those characteristics continue to form moreover over time in us. It is that great exchange he made for us on the cross, which is our pathetic nature for his glorious one, our ignominy for his glory, our sinfulness for his righteousness. As people began to respond in history to the gospel, in one of a few different ways, God sought to bring about his judgment on the earth once again. For believers, or followers of Christ, who is God the Son, that judgment is meant to purify us by burning away the dross from our lives so that we may be with him. We've talked a great deal about this process that Peter names sanctification here in this letter and how that's instilling, us, instilling in us that holiness without which no one will see the Lord. For Peter, it is the believer's duty to cooperate with our Lord to the end that we may become holy and have our minds renewed in transformation as God uses the trials Peter is discussing to that end. This next thought reveals a little about that, and it contrasts it with the condemnation that all unbelievers are already under, and what that will mean for them if they do not turn. Let's get into the text and see what Peter means. Verse 15, make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer, or thief, or evildoer, or a troublesome meddler. <clears throat> Now, it's a truism, we talked about it a little earlier, that everyone will suffer in the course of their lives. Have you thought about this? 
If you are a lawless individual, then you will encounter suffering at the hands of those that God has called to enforce the law for people's protection. At least that's the way it's supposed to work. Now, we live in a day where increasingly they call good evil and evil good, and so we see a great attempt to pervert God's justice. But God's standards remain the same because God is eternal and so are his standards. Uh, Peter here is taking the time to specify the kinds of things that humans do in rebellion against God. And, and in a few words, he covers pretty much the entire gamut of sin possible. He names murder, theft, the general doing of evil, and attempts to meddle. Uh, one of our modern words for that, by the way, is to regulate uh, in the affairs of others. Now, we could say a great deal about each of those, but I'll leave those words for your own private study uh, at this time with a word of caution. Everything in that list has more than one meaning. There is a surface level meaning and there are several meanings that go deeper. Uh, I'll just let you think about that and we're gonna move on. As he lists off the bad behaviors that bring condemnation and punishment to men and women, Peter is saying to his fellow believers, of uh, which we trust everyone here is one, to make sure that none of, none of us suffer for any of those reasons. This bears a few moments on what Peter's actually saying. He's saying, he is not saying, rather, that it's okay to do these things if you don't get caught. How do we know that? Well, it's going to become clear momentarily, but um, it is because God sees everything. He has caught you. And he will reward you appropriately for the kinds of works you do. Now, before anyone accuses me here of preaching a works-based salvation, uh, I most certainly am not. We are not saved by our works, but by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, as recorded in the scriptures alone, to the glory of God alone. But we are judged by our works because it is the works that show what your faith was truly in. Let's look at a Bible passage about that. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, it says, <clears throat> beginning in verse 11, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from all the things which were written in the books, according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and, and, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and here's the critical part. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds, which is just another word for works. Then death and hell were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. That's Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 15. You see, there will be no one who does not deserve to go into eternal judgment that does not deserve to go there, or perhaps even want to go there. You don't believe me? Are you aware that Elon Musk, the world's richest man, recently tweeted out that he would be willing to go to hell because most people will be there. You still think he's a Christian, brothers? He isn't. Don't be sucked in by media trickery, even if it comes from the Babylon Bee. Peter's point here is that we are not supposed to do these things because God 
sees everything. We'll see that in a minute, uh, but we have to read to get there. Verse 16, but if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. A common tactic of the enemy is to try to evoke feelings of guilt when we are falsely told we are doing something wrong. Uh, tried to, for a while to think of an example of this, and this is kind of what I came up with. It goes like this. No, I don't believe the Bible. I'm more scientific. Because my beliefs are based on actual facts and science, I guess that makes you a dolt and an idiot. You can shut up now and stand quietly facing the corner. Uh, in fact, no, it doesn't do that. But the attempt here isn't really to convince you. Um, it's to make you feel false guilt to take you out of the game. I'm almost certain everyone I know that has ever tried to preach the gospel has come up against some line like that. Um, it's kind of a straw man combined with an ad hominem attack, uh, and it's intended to make you feel small and ineffective. So Peter says that if you are indeed suffering wrongly in this fashion as a Christian, you're doing Christianity proper. Um, in fact, he says this shouldn't be effective on us. We should actually, uh, you should not actually be ashamed. Dealing with the emotion is a trick of its own, by the way. Uh, and it's not Peter's topic here, so I'm not going to talk about that. But instead, you should be praising God that he has counted you worthy to share in Christ's reproach and sufferings. It's actually your honor to do so. So my answer to that dude went something like this. Oh, you say you're scientific. Have you ever considered uh, that the lies that cause you to believe that anti-science garbage are built on nothing but quicksand? I have a degree in biology. Have you ever heard of the second law of thermodynamics? Evolution breaks it, and not just the second law. We are trained as scientists to read the data impartially, and, impar and an impartial reading of the data tell me that you haven't been given the correct data or that you have interpreted it wrongly. Now, that conversation took about 45 minutes, and that's probably an overdramatized abbreviation of it. But I did have that conversation with one of my former lab demonstrators in third year. Now, uh, and by the way, we were still on speaking terms at the end of it as well. So a lot of this was jovial and kind of joking and jabbing and like, like that. It wasn't a bad conversation per se, but um, both of us were also very bold in our speech. So, you know, that's the way it went. Um, in the end, though, he said he would consider what I said if I would consider what he said, and I did too. As you can, say, it's, as you can see, it still didn't change my mind. My point here, and I believe it is in part Peter's point, is that you don't have to be shamed into silence. If you can't answer an objector, I can understand that, but there are answers to all objections, and it does take time to learn them. So learn them, and, and, and pray about the hard questions. This verse isn't entirely about that, but it's worth mentioning. The greater context of this verse really is about the judgment that's coming on all the earth. Now, Peter knows about it, and he's at this moment discussing that coming judgment. Next verse. Verse 17, For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who did not obey the gospel of God? You know, there's a lot that can be said here. And as I was studying for this, it came to me with, in such rapid succession um, that I had to take a few minutes to organize my thoughts and then go back to the beginning and write them out in full. Uh, I, I will make that statement to those of you Bereans out there that also love to study the Word, by the way. 
Um, you may at some point experience this, and I want you to know what to do. So when this starts to happen, let it happen. Let it flow over you. Take in all that you can. Will you get it all? Probably not. You know, but jot it down in point form, abbreviated thoughts as they occur. Then go back and think clearly and in a disciplined fashion, or should I say disciple-like fashion, on each point. This verse is just that, and, and I hope it's a good example of what I mean. So let's get into that verse. Um, first, you have to remember that there is a judgment of God for sin for the whole world, and the sentence has already been passed. Remember what it says in John chapter 3. Let's, let's look at this. John chapter 3, verses 18 to 21 reads, He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men loved the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light, so that his deeds may be manifested, that is, may be made visible, as having been wrought in God. John chapter 3, verses 18 to 21. Jesus informed us that this judgment has already occurred and that this sentence has already been passed. Everyone in the world will face it individually and they will be judged by their deeds, the things they have done, their works. And whether or not their names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life. According to the passage that we just looked at from Revelation chapter 20. The opportunity to escape that judgment and wrath is found only, I repeat, only in the gospel of Jesus Christ by repenting of our sins Remember, that means turning away from our sins, stopping doing them. And by believing that Jesus personally paid for our individual sins individually when he died on the cross. That is where judgment for sin and the wrath of God began to be poured out on the world. But it didn't end there. The next step is that God begins to pour out that wrath on sin in others besides his son Jesus onto the next closest thing, right? It's kind of it hits at a certain point and kind of flows out like concentric circles, right? So what's nearest to Christ? Those who follow him. Why would we begin here? You ask. Well, I think it's because we're the ones that claim to be followers of Christ, God the Son, who bore the entire brunt of the wrath of God for our sins. And as such, we are held to a higher standard than unbelievers. That being God's holy standard. Jesus even gave those standards through his earthly life and ministry. Uh, let's look for look at a verse for that. Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, beginning in verse 34. But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, uh, who were just weird Gnostics, uh, they gathered themselves together. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, which is the great commandment of the law? And he said to him, quoting, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, 
and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it, quoting, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. So, apart from the wisdom writings, the Psalms, Proverbs, etc., all of the law, all of what all of the prophets said, those two sentences sum it all up. Now, those of you following in your Bibles will, will note Jesus is actually quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, and Leviticus 19, verse 18. Now, you know why we always quote scripture, I suppose. But that's only one example of him giving his standards to us. The Sermon on the Mount, which is Matthew chapters 5 through 7, is one of the most famous and well-known occasions of giving those standards. And nothing he said there was obscure or unclear. Not to the crowds then, anyway. Time and deliberate obfuscation has hidden some of the meaning today anyway. But careful study will still reveal and unlock it. Learn it so that you can make God's calling and choosing of you certain and escape that wrath of God as he judges us by our deeds and what we did with the identity of his son Jesus Christ. Now, if that wrathful judgment begins here, where does it go when it's done with us who will believe and follow? Well, it moves out of the camp of those who believe and over to the ones that do not. The passage that we looked at in Revelation chapter 20 is the ultimate fulfillment of that. Men will be judged by their deeds. Isaiah tells us that our deeds are like, and I'm saying this literally here, uh, all our deeds are like used menstrual rags. Beloved, our deeds, plural, all of them. They are a bloody, messy, filthy stench in the nostrils of God. And no unbeliever will be found in the Lamb's Book of Life. Ever. You see, there's an equation I need to explain to you here. Well, uh, it isn't exactly a mathematical equation, it's more of an in equation separated by two equations, separating two equations. But, um, I'll list the two equations. Obedience in the Old Testament is equal to faith in the New Testament, also in the Old Testament. Um, but disobedience is equal to unbelief or lack of faith in the Old and New Testaments. Those two things are not the same. And people today try to treat them as a balanced equation. If you do just a little of this, but you don't do a little of that, and you take a little from here, and you take a little from there, it's all going to work out because it's all about balance. No, it's not. No, it is not. The two equations pretty much explain everything that we need to know. If you believe, you will obey. If you do not believe, you will not obey. It does not allow for partially believing and partially obeying. Both equations are absolute values and will not suffer partial pressures. Now, I, I could make the joke there that there, that's because there is no partiality with God, but that's not really the point, and it strips from meaning and distracts, so I'm not gonna say that. Oops, too late. <laughs> um, look, There can be, uh, indeed, there will not be any hedging or fudging 
with an all-seeing, all-knowing, all-powerful, and wrathful, but holy God. You either believe or you don't. You will either, I say it again, you will either believe or you will not. Some have said, like Billy Graham, who was right on this point anyway, uh, have said that the job of the preacher is to bring you to the point of decision. You are either willing to proceed in faith or you are not. And no one else on earth or in heaven can or will make that decision for you. What you need, as we used to say when I was growing up, to fish or cut bait. Um, either get on with and obey Christ or don't. But be clear about your choice. Also, you should know that refusing to make a decision is the same as deciding against obedience because of the nature of the already existing sentence and condemnation that we are all under. So make up your mind. And Peter illustrates this with a quote of his own. Verse 18, And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Now, Peter is quoting here Proverbs chapter 11, verse 31, which reads, If the righteous will be rewarded in the earth, how much more the wicked and the sinner. What's the first thing you notice here, brothers? Go ahead, take a shot. First thing you notice between the verses that stated and the verse in Proverbs chapter 11 that I just read. No, it's not the same. The words are not the same. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it, it kind of means the same thing. I could do the backflips to get you there. They're not backflips, really. It's just a stroll to open a different door. But um, the verses don't match. So here's a tip for biblical interpretation for everybody out there. Um, they don't have to match. Uh, it comes down to who actually authored scripture. Who wrote this letter? Peter, right? Peter, yeah. Uh, or, or at least he dictated it to a scribe who wrote it down for him. Yeah. Uh, we know he did that with the Gospel of Mark. That's actually Peter's Gospel. Okay. Which kind of explains some stuff, but that's another issue. Um, so where did Peter then get his thoughts for this letter. Well, we're taught that despite the instrument used for recording it, that it is the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead himself, that inspired the authors of Scripture. He authored all of it, regardless of who wrote it down. Peter was given this interpretation that differed in wording, but not necessarily thought, from the text written. We think here by King Solomon, by the way. Um, the writer of Scripture is free to use the interpretation, if you will, that the Holy Spirit gave him in that instance without breaking Scripture at all. We, however, are not in that category and must confine ourselves with the words that Peter wrote down. He was the inspired writer and we merely read with the guidance of that same spirit what he wrote. But that same spirit is the spirit that authored all of the work in the first place. Throw that out there for you understand that when you come to this kind of situation in the scriptures. So having said that, Peter is simply illustrating his point that he made in verse 17 with an Old Testament quote. In this case, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 31. Well, what's he saying here? 
He's saying this, look, it wasn't easy what Christ did to save you. Christ himself prayed that he would not have to go to the cross because he knew what his flesh would go through. Now, who wants that? Hey. But he yielded to the Father's will for our benefit and to give all of the glory to God. And if that's what it took to save all the sinners that would ever turn to him, what chance does the reprobate have if he tries to do it himself? Zero. If you're asking me, I have to sadly and with some on terror say, none. He has no chance at all. The Latin phrase is confutatus maledictus. It means consigned to flames of woe. And that condemnation is eternal, conscious, and for us very much necessary to avoid turning to Christ in faith and repenting of all our wrong thoughts, words, and deeds. Wrath and judgment is the fate of all men, including our Lord Jesus Christ. Think about that. In my thinking, that wrath hits the bullseye in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ as the volunteer, the perfect, willing sacrifice. And then, boom, radiates out from that center in concentric-like circles. First hitting Christ, who bore that stroke for all those that the Father chose from before time began and gave to the Son so that they could be conformed to Him by that wrath, which for them only bears the weight of trial, and that for their sanctification. And then, when it's done with them, out to the rest of those who will not turn and be saved because they did not love the truth. And that leaves every human on the planet with a choice. And that brings us to our last thought and a bit of an application. Verse 19. Therefore, suffer for what is right and not what is wrong. Paul E. Bilheimer wrote a series of three books, the first uh, two of which I read a little over 30 years ago. Uh, those books are titled uh, Destined for the Throne, which is all about the Bride of Christ and how she's being purified by the trials that we go through, it. and Don't Waste Your Sorrows, a treatise on how to view the trials in your life as you're purified. Um, both of those works I would, I would definitely re recommend to you as reading. Um, the third book is a little more charismatic, uh, though not wrong in, in most places. It gets into kind of weirdness. Uh, it engages in what I would call non-biblical views on how spiritual gifts and prayer work together. Uh, so I, I don't really recommend reading it. Yes, I have read it. Uh, that's why I don't recommend it. Um, but those first two books point out that everyone suffers. You suffer for hitting a wall in frustration, or you suffer because of what is frustrating you without hitting the wall and causing yourself physical pain. In either case, you still suffer. Here's a question. Would the wall ever hurt? <laughs> Why take out your frustrations on somebody else? And we've all had frustrations taken out on us. And I'm pretty sure we've taken our frustrations out on others. And that's not right. Moving on, we have a clear choice about our attitudes and responses when confronted with unavoidable suffering. And what do I mean when I say unavoidable? Well, let's say that the Romans had just rearrested you and put you in the darkest hole in Rome to await execution just a few years after setting you free. And your name is Paul, also known as Saul of Tarsus. He had no choice about the jail or the pain or the lousy and insufficient food or, or even the pending execution. But he did have a choice 
over his attitudes and reactions to how he displayed them. Along more modern lines, let's say you like to growl at people when they call you out on social shortcomings, say. Um, is that growling really Christ-like? Might be Belker-like if you were a Hill Street Blues fan, right? Uh, but it's not Christ-like. Is, is screaming at somebody, that's just the way I am! Uh, in full screech, <laughs> a way to treat the holy brethren that are showing concern for a clear and recognizable issue in your life? Maybe even sin? Well, no, not really. Um, though it is understandable that if you're not regenerate and can't or maybe don't want to change, or if you are regenerate, maybe just trying to walk in the flesh because it's easier than picking up your cross and dying to yourself like Jesus commanded and modeled for us. And when he couldn't go any further, they got some brother out of the crowd to help. For the regenerate believer, and there is no other kind, you have a clear choice, which is to continue in your sin longer or mortify the deeds of the flesh, as John Owen wrote. And by the way, he was quoting Paul. <laughs> and walk in the spirit of Christ. This concept is littered all over the New Testament. And it is a daily, sometimes moment by moment choice to walk this way. For those that will, Peter has some good news. Let's see what he said. Verse 19, therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. At a starting point, Peter's encapsulating the choice, but he isn't stating it like a choice, to be fair. There are two ways to suffer, and he has even covered them in this last paragraph, verse, thought, you know, whatever you call it. You can, as the verse says, suffer according to the will of God, or you suffer, well, not according to the will of God. This is nothing less than the, top, the topic of our last few studies in 1 Peter. You can suffer for doing what's wrong, and that brings a certain kind of suffering that you probably don't want. Uh, and then you can suffer for what's right, according to the will of God for your life because he knows what's best for you and what will best glorify him. When you figure out what, the, what choice is the one you want, then you really need to just get on with it. Remember, refusing to choose is the same as choosing the negative, because no action or effort is required to those who are still under the sentence of death for sin and the condemnation that will result in your eternal and conscious torment in hell. And I refuse to sugarcoat that destiny because it seems to me you can avoid it if you really want to. But if you choose to suffer, if that is the will of God for your life, it is a different story. I find the need here to remind you of what the will of God was for many believers in the day that Peter wrote this particular missive. Some were turned into human torches to light Nero's garden. That is, they were lit on fire and burned to death as an oversized torch. Some were crucified like Peter, who tradition has it was actually crucified upside down because he did not think himself worthy to perish the way our Lord did nailed to a cross in the normal fashion. Yeah, like that's normal, I'm sorry, Peter. You know, uh, it's said by the way that Peter took three days to die, so. Some, being Roman citizens, were simply executed. 
as either an archer or spear target practice, beheaded like the Apostle Paul. Some were herded into coliseums and fed alive to starve predatory animals like lions and tigers. We don't face that kind of suffering at this moment in history, but we could see it again. That was what the will of God meant to them and the way God purified them for his glory. Some survived and spread the gospel in a hostile environment. It's just really a little worse than today. That too brings a kind of suffering as does walking in self-inflicted in self poverty or, or the need of housing like that. That might be the will of God for your purification or holiness. Whatever the case, if that's what you choose, then you can know that your faithful creator can be trusted to do what is right for you and not only bring the best for what he has in the here and now, spiritually speaking, but to preserve you to live forever with him. And what he's doing is right. And not just for him, but for you. And maybe for others as well. It, it strikes me that this is the main issue of walking in the spirit by faith and, and repentance. Um, who do you really trust to get you to the end with the most benefit for you, the most glory for God, for those that are important to you, like that? If you will not trust God, then who or what are you placing your trust in? You don't have to answer that question to me out loud, but only a fool says in his heart, no, God. Trust him. And you will get to the end and be in God's very best for you when his kingdom finally comes. Please notice, I am not referring to earthly wealth, but that which is laid up for us in heaven, in the spirit. You know, if you get into the name and claim stuff after everything else we've gone through over the last few years, then there's probably not a lot more I can say to you other than repent and believe the gospel and follow Christ. Um, that's more or less what I saw in, in this text this evening. Now the next time, because I know you're wondering, we're all going to do chapter 5. All of it, because it's only 14 verses long. Um, and I'm pretty sure we can fit all that in. We did this evening. So um, after that, we'll be taking a couple of weeks off so I can prepare for 2 Peter. Remember, we don't use uh, you know pre-designed lesson plans here. Uh, basically, we're making up our own as we go along. And that's the only right way to do this. Sorry. Um, do the work yourself. Um, perhaps you're familiar uh, with the current, uh, until next week, president of the Southern Baptist uh, Convention named Ed Litton. Ed Litton, as it turned out, about, well, I don't know, a week or so after he was elected as the president of the Southern Baptist Convention last year, uh, was exposed as a plagiarist. All of his sermons, he borrowed from past president of the SBC, J.D. Greer, without J.D. Greer's permission. And it turns out that J.D. Greer bought his sermons from an outfit called Docent, who are very heavily Catholic and not really Christian at all. Yeah, so, do the work yourself. Read it for yourself, understand it for yourself. I know this is hard. I do it every week, and I do it for you. It's the only way you can really learn this stuff. Do the work yourself. All right, so, uh, like I said, we're going to be preparing 2 Peter is our next book after uh, next study. Uh, you can start inviting people out for that now if you want. So go ahead. Uh, we don't turn people away at the door unless they're like drunk or you know disturbing and like that. So and we would only turn them away uh, in that case if they were disruptive.
So, uh, also by way of special announcements, uh, I'm starting a discipleship class here in a few weeks. Um, this is a class for any believer that wants to deepen their walk with Christ, which I hope is all of you, but it's designed to help largely new followers of Christ begin to discipline themselves to walk with Him. But it's also good for older folks to remind themselves, or maybe to pick up new tricks. Um, let me know if you want to participate. We don't have all the timing type details yet, but uh, we'll announce more of that as it becomes available. Uh, hopefully, we will see you all for the book club tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. Eastern on twitch.tv slash simuljustice at Picator. It's Picator because there's only one C. Um, as we read the Gospel's Power and Message by our brother Paul Washer. Until then, God bless. Alex, come on up here and close the prayer for us and then just take us out, okay? Thanks. Father, we uh, come to you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and we thank you for the uh, uh, your word and uh, that you used uh, Brother Jerry to feed us uh, with your word and to edify us. And we pray that uh, you would sanctify us with your truth. And pray, that, pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for joining us here at BereanNation.com Bible Study. If you have any questions, please email PastorJer at Outlook.com. That's PastorJer at Outlook.com. Here at Berean Nation, we always like to remind every Christian to be a Berean to search the scriptures to see if it is so. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time. God bless. Thanks. Now, just on your way out the door, folks, we're glad you came. We hope you enjoyed it, and uh, don't kill us just yet. Yeah, I know. Okay. I know. I know. Fair enough. <clears throat> All right. So, listen, it's a dangerous world out there, so keep your head down. It's particularly dangerous if you don't have Christ in your life. And if that's something that interests you, having Christ in your life, shoot us an email at the address that uh, Alex shared just a minute ago, and we'd be happy to make that introduction. So remember, be safe, God bless, good night.